see. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Division of Landscape Architecture series titled Assembling Futures. Just one second. Brandon, is this recording? Yeah, it is. Sorry, I just want to make sure. Okay, sorry. Um, we have two lectures already by Professor Chuao Li and Montira Unaku dealing with the role that heritage and conservation strategies play in expanding landscape practices and shaping environmental futures. Our lecture series has an exciting lineup of guests that are engaging with the questions are engaging with these questions and we look forward to the evolving conversations around these themes across the semester. We hope to inspire our critical reflections of competing visions of building future, future worlds in the face of growing uncertainty and unfolding environmental crises. In today's lecture by Man Barua, we will open onto another set of multidisciplinary perspectives introducing alternative lenses by which to consider the city, plan its infrastructures and honor its residents, both human and non-human alike. Man will be speaking from Germany and we are very grateful uh, to have him today. He has just had a baby, so we're really uh, um, lucky to have him. Um, Man is a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Cambridge. Prior to joining Cambridge, Mann was a, was a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the School of Geography and, Environmental, and Environment at the University of Oxford. His work explores the material and biotic environment through its economies, politics, and ontologies. His work in urban ecology de uh, developed in part through the European Research Council grant, employs ethnographic and ethological methods to, uh, to position cities within an ecological formation, offering to us new understandings of urban life, including its infrastructures, its mat mat materialities, and biopolitics, ultimately per perhaps expanding ideas of a uh, metabolism of the city. Ma Man's forthcoming book, Lively Cities, Reconfiguring Urban Ecology, will be published by Minnesota University Press in May 2023. The book, departs from con conventions of urban studies to argue that cities are lived life achievements forged by a multitude of entities, human and non-humans, that make up the material politi politics of city making. So please welcome uh, Man Baru. Uh, thank you, Natalia, uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you so much, um, Sony, as well, for, for being uh, being a discussant on this talk. Um, shall I just go to screen share? I've got some slides to show. So if that's okay. Can people uh, see the screen? Uh, Natalia? Um, I see it. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, as, as Natalia mentioned, this is part of a kind of broader, um, this talk is part of a broader project on urban ecologies that I've been doing for the past few years, uh, focusing on three cities, uh, London, Delhi, and Guwahati in Northeast India. And what I'm going to be talking about is, is um, really research on, on, on Delhi, trying to kind of rethink uh, urban infrastructure when we, start to look at it from the perspective of non-human life. So without ado, I'll, 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 I'll go into the talk. Um, so in April 2016, the upmarket district of Delhi's Connaught Place and Janpath had a sudden power outage. It lasted several hours. A troop of macaques, which you can see in this picture, scrambled down concrete high rises to nick food from a street vendor. Upon being chased, the animals clambered up pipes to reach safer heights before crossing a busy road via high tension cable wires. Amidst the commotion, one animal fell in onto the main transformer connecting the power grid. It sparked a short circuit. A crowd soon assembled, some trying to figure out what the commotion was about, others irate about a blackout in the April heat. This is the second time in 18 months that monkeys have caused a power breakdown, complained the owner of an apparel store. 
emergency repair staff was called in, but they were unable to remove the electrocuted macaque as other members of its NATO troop prevented people from getting close. Almost every rooftop in the vicinity had macaques displaying aggression towards onlookers, especially repair staff, desperately trying to remove the dead animal. It was hours, therefore, before electric supply, electricity supply was restored. Delhi's macaque population has proliferated in the last three decades, sometimes referred to as the city's monkey menace in the popular press and in government circulars. The animals are the center of a whole set of controversies about urban inhabitation and belonging. Macaque's abilities to negotiate the city draws from their enmeshment with the infrastructural environment, pipes, cables, buildings, and walls, which the animals, I would argue, repurpose for their own mobilities and dwelling. When macaques trigger power outages, such as the one in Kadot Place, they pose a whole set of questions about the material and political life of infrastructure albeit not in ways commonplace in the exploding literature on the topic. We might then ask, what might it mean to ecologize infrastructure, to bring to the fore some of the elusive relations that constitute urban form, its modes of inhabitation and attendant economies? What does such an approach offer up for querying urban theory and its grammars? And if we take Ashamin and Nigel Thrift's observation, the cities everywhere are orchestrated by human and non-human means, then what accounts of material and political life do relations between macaques and infrastructure bring to the fore? So these are some of the questions that I would really like to um, address in this talk. And it stems from this concern that urban life worlds can be seen as becoming infrastructural in all its dimensions, from the economic to the cultural and political. Much of the innovative work on infrastructure has examined how claims to staples, including water, electricity, sanitation, provide what Hannah Appel and her colleagues call a new ethnographic and analytical frame to defamiliarize and think and rethink the political. As technologies of enchantment, promising economic prosperity, development and modernity, infrastructures shape experiences of everyday life. They are sites of social and material claims, where questions of urban citizenship are produced, contested, and revealed. The literature and infrastructure, especially in anthropology, argues that the politics surrounding infrastructure is increasingly molded in the techno-political field that can consist of relations with a gamut of things, from pipes, and this is Nikhil Allen's work, to energy grids, for instance, the work of Law Creaky, and roads, again, you know, Harvey and Knox. And yet, I would argue, these analyses revert to what I would call a major urban grammar. The political is recast in terms of identity, and categories mobilized often forecloses who inhabits or belongs in the city. A retinue of other than human beings that graft and contest what it means to be urban therefore go missing. A common theme on work on infrastructure, a mantra even, is breakdown and the kinds of life to which breakdown gives rise. Infrastructures, as Brian Larkin writes, bleed. However, as the instance of macaques show, infrastructures can bleed in polyvalent in, and, and unexpected ways. Power outages triggered by macaques can render visible dispersed geographies of the city. In June 2011, newspapers in Delhi reported how a power line tripped by a macaque in East Delhi's IP extension spark power cuts in several residential localities, Lajpat Nagar, Maharani Bagh, New, Friend Colony, New Friends Colony, in the city's south. The event brought the complexity of infrastructural provisioning into relief from transmitters to distributors and their attendant bureaucracies. Staff of Delhi Transco Limited, a public sector enterprise responsible for transmitting power, remarked how they first tried isolating the system by stopping the flow of power when the macaque entered the supply substation. After dodging attempts of being caught for almost half an hour, the macaque inadvertently got tangled in electric cables. Not only did the unfortunate animals each also tripped, Delhi Transco therefore was forced to cut power supplies. Oh, it's saying my connection is unstable, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, disruptions, however, can be much more mundane folded into the very pulse of the everyday. 
Monkeys destroy plants, but they don't stop there. Electric cables, dish antennae, antennae, CCTV cameras, telephone wires, and even PNG fittings are not left alone, remarks a resident of a resident's welfare association in East Delhi. They move about with the help of wires. A mishap can lead to a situation that is life-threatening for people. Torn wires and cables are a frequent complaint in Delhi. Ethnographic attention shows that this is not simply the outcome of macaque's mobility, but is influenced by a range of concerns animating the modernist city. Macaques have become a serious point of contention in Delhi's Tisazari or lower court complex, where they have begun to hinder the installation of internet infrastructure. The animal's presence around courts is fostered through regular provisioning by those embroiled in litigation. And this is really key, you know, the acts of um, provisioning which allows macaques to survive in, in, in urban areas. For instance, people caught up in what are generally long-winded and protracted judicial processes in Indian courts often pray to Lord Hanuman, as he is known as Sankat Mochan, or the reliever from misfortune. Offering food to Hanuman is a means of appeasing, uh, uh, sorry, offering food to macaques is a means of appeasing Hanuman, an endeavor to obtain liberation from distress and disputes. Infrastructural disruptions happen as a result of this concatenated ecology. Macaques are seen as intermediaries summoning supernatural powers, provisioning means that the animals associate courts with food. As a result, and in the words of the Secretary of Delhi's Bar Association, monkeys are not only damaging the court's records, but sometimes files and documents are found strewn in the corridors and power cables containing sensitive data are found snapped. Yet, Making sense of the entanglements between other than human ecologies and infrastructure through the language of breakdown, I would argue, is quite limiting. In this language, macaques would only be seen as a transgressive force whose destructive acts bring quotidian relations with infrastructure otherwise withdrawn into the background to sharp relief. The analytic of breakdown forecloses other questions that might be asked about the material life of urban infrastructure. Asking such questions requires developing what I call a minor ecology of infrastructure to express social and material claims about infrastructure in a register that sees cities as, an, as ensembles of human and other than human rhythms and which gather a multitude of other stories vibrating within the urban. The minor does not come from a minor language, but the quote from Deleuze and Guattari's short treatise on Kafka, it is that which a minority constructs within a major language. The minor is about expression, I would argue, in a cramped space. The language of the urban canon ascendant in the Western tradition, as well as urban theory from the global south, much of which is articulated in the major key. In the major key, infrastructure is refracted through a notion of design that is hylomorphic or which has to do with the stamping of form upon inert matter. Hylomorphism as many of you will be familiar, derives from the Aristotelian idea that to create anything, one has to inform, uh, one has to impose form or morph upon matter, heil, an idea that has become deeply embedded in urban grammar, from architecture to art, design to technology, policy to planning, and even certain strands of geography and anthropology. Hylomorphism imagines the environment to be an outcome of the activity of building, and this is the whole kind of discourse around the built environment, right? The, the city has the built environment, giving primacy to a world laid out by humans for their use and in advance of who or what inhabits it. In this view, macaque's actions would result in variance, phenomena or events deviating from intended script. So, you know, you build a particular world and the transgressive macaque then somehow unsettles the script that humans um, impose upon a city. Um, I'll just, sorry, I've just lost my A minor practice, on the other hand, is to rework a major language from within. It is about formulating concepts and denominations of the urban canon differently. But the minor does not stand apart from the major, and we cannot have one without the other. The minor always trails the major like a thing and a shadow, even though the latter is routinely suppressed. The major and the minor are therefore two treatments of the same urban language. One consists in extracting constants, 
where the human assumes the standard measure and urban frame of reference. The other, I would argue, the minor, places these in continuous variation. I argue that work on infrastructure is predominantly written in the major key, and as such, it is incomplete, cleaved to the minor practices that are inventive, making and remaking urban life. A minor ecology is therefore about the production and proliferation of polyvalent and collective connections. Polyvalent as connections are brought about by heterogeneous agents and polyvalent, a word that comes from Valencia, meaning power or competence, as it includes a range of competencies of which the human is one among many. For instance, the quotidian rhythms of Macaques and Connaught Place, Delhi's premier business hub, where much of my fieldwork took place, indicates this. Architectural features of the city become part of the Macaques' urban worlds, as does a range of other provisioning infrastructures. They use overhead tanks um, dotted across most high rises in the metropolis to bathe. Macaques have learned to open their covers, and if the plastic tanks are empty, they even knock them off our terrace, says Rashid, who has installed locks on the storage tanks in Old Delhi to prevent macaques from getting into them. Taps become reliable sources of drinking water in an urban environment where basic staples, and fresh water, one could argue, is a staple for macaques too, are localized and scarce. The animals not only know where taps are located within their territories, but some, though not all, have learned to open them with ease. Usually left running, precious water goes to waste, much to the chagrin of residents. So here you can see in this picture, the macaques are drinking from a tap which they've learned to open. People, however, respond to macaque infrastructure and meshments. Taps can be replaced with a different design, as you can see in the other picture, so that water does not go to waste. The city, in fact, brims with such small stories of other ebbs and flows, easily blotted out in mainstream accounts of urban life and infrastructure. A video of one individual, and I hope, well, this works, uh, um, closing a tap after use went viral on the internet, sparking speculative anthropomorphized memes of macaque's proclivity for water conservation. While it's difficult to apprehend what sparked this individual to do so, and whether closing taps could in the future become a skill macaques acquire, um, and if they especially if they understand that it reduces antagonism from people, the dexterity and neophilia macaques exhibit are reflective of the competencies the animals develop when inhabiting complex urban worlds. So they basically learn how to open the tap in a particular direction and you know, um, anti-clockwise. And this particular individual, as we saw in that video, learned how to close it. But whether this is a pattern that develops across macaques, uh, that we'll have to wait and see. So macaques bring novel architectural and infrastructural labyrinths into being. The polyvalent connections macaques draw involve what the ecological psychologist James Gibson calls affordances, what an environmental thing furnishes for an animal. Affordances are relational. They're not merely physical properties, but neither are they collapsible entirely to a sentient subject. Rather, affordances imply complementarity between the perceiver and perceived. In Delhi, macaques have in fact begun to shift from what is a rural terrestriality, where they're kind of ground dwelling in rural areas, to an urban arboreality. But the rooftops, but the world of rooftops and concrete buildings, from the macaque's point of view, is also ground. And as you can see in this picture, you know, they start inhabiting um, the tops of buildings and so on and so forth. But there's an inversion of that rural terrestriality into an urban arboreality. The landscapes that so emerge is akin to what um, urban geographer Matthew Gandhi calls unintentional landscapes, which are landscapes in spite of themselves. But we might push this reasoning further. The notion of unintentional rests on the distinction between what the scholastics termed essentia, or the essence of an object, and accidentia, or properties that arise from chance. What determines the distinction between essence and accident is the nature of the bond between the object and the person. Infrastructural labyrinths of the city become unintentional landscapes when the frame of reference is human design or who forms the bonds is taken as a given. But if one were to replace the human with a macaque, 
or shift the frame of reference to a meshwork ecology where there's no centralized panoptic eye, which encounters constitute an urban landscape and what relations give its characteristic, designed or accidental, is re-envisioned. So in Connaught Place and in, Old Del and in Old Delhi, it is not unusual to see macaques crossing busy uh, streets or making their way into buildings via electric cables, as you can see in this picture here. The tangle of overhead wires, as to what kind of giant spider has woven its way through the city, can leave the first time visitors spellbound. So Hale Hashmi, a commentator on Delhi, calls this meshwork muck with colonial legacies, whose proliferation, he says, rests on native genius in the form of illicit tapping. The meshwork, is an un in Hashmi's words, is an unholy mess used by armies of monkeys on their daily journeys in search of food. There is a politics of aesthetics here, and this is vital for, you know, broader debates of removing macaques from the city, a theme that I can't really go into depth uh, today, but it's part of the wider book. Um, however, examining how these overhead wires proliferate, raveling here, unraveling there, is vital for understanding how arboreal worlds of macaques emerge. The city of uh, the rise of Delhi's infrastructure is uh, electric infrastructure, especially, is preceded by a complex history of stately rituals, political actions, and legal struggles. And the work of Coleman here is, is, is quite interesting in this regard. Equally, its proliferation and growth has been about hooking onto the energy grid via improvised and often unauthorized connections. As you can see here, you know, lots of wires which are stuck onto the grid by people, the kind of illicit tapping of electricity that gives rise to this particular kind of meshwork. So the morphology of the Delhi electropolis is the product of two sets of forces. The expansion of informal or illegal settlements, in the state's words, and their claims to energy supply, as well as the state's attempts to regulate infrastructural access. Delhi witnessed the privatization of its state-run electricity supply and distribution in the early 2000s. Reforms were aimed at addressing discontent over insufficient coverage and plague delivery growing out of a rapid spread in unplanned settlements and with them increased demands on the energy grid. Newly set up distribution companies or DISCOMs as they are called, rapidly expanded into unplanned settlements, partly to curtail high rates of theft, theft and distribution losses, but also to expand their consumer base. Unique numbers were assigned to each household and if the connections were illegal, they were regularized through new, new, newly installed electric meters. And this is the typical argument around electricity and infrastructure, you know, um, Antina von Schitzer's work, for instance, you know, the, that um, infrastructure has become a means of state making and, and, and so on and so forth. But as a tacit means of assimilation, the regularization of connections brings marginalized populations into the ambit of, state, of the state and capital. However, challenges posed by the operative ge geometries of electrification including inefficiencies in coordination, differences in sectorial logics, and a lack of planning, mean that DISCOMs are continually caught between implementing directives of Delhi's urban master plan and attending to informal urban urbanization. For instance, the substations and transformers um, that are, frequent, are frequently installed on the berms of roads, often the only available land in settlements with limited space and high urban density. Unplanned expansion of buildings, including extensions such as balconies, encroach upon electricity equipment and breach stipulated minimum distances from electric infrastructure. Such architectonic outgrowths make it easier for illegal connections, typically clandestine, non-metered non graphs onto a transmission line to be devised. Arguing against the narrative of failed planning, the scholar Ananya Roy says that informality is a planning regime, an instrument of both accumulation and authority. Informality is a deregulated rather than unregulated domain, not necessarily a grassroots phenomenon running parallel to the formal and the legal, but a mode of discipline, power, and regulation existing at the very heart of the state. The analytical filter of in informal urbanism, however, I would argue, fall short in attending to some of the currents witnessed here, notably how infrastructure becomes an arboreal more than human world. For this, we need to turn to minor practices. Hooking onto the grid through illicit wires, sometimes called katiyas in the vernacular, and put in place by katiyabas, 
professionals who purloin electricity is a glaring example. The practice of rerouting electricity, one could argue, is akin to drawing lines with wires, an act through which the electric meshwork proliferates. Minor practices of the urban electrician or Katyabas subvert state power and its attendant hylomorphic matter form model from which such power derives. Here, ideas and laws assume a model's coherence. Engineers operate with laws of voltage, capacity, frequency, and load, sub submitting matter to a specific form. In contrast to the engineer, the Katyabas is a bricolo, operating through rules of thumb, but not subordinating these to to laws and a matter form model. The katia is hooked onto the grid, that is hooked onto the grid, is not so much a connector, but a graph, a wire that is grown with the electric meshwork joining into its generative flows. Whilst engineers and the state seek to prepare matter for form, the minor practice of the katia bars is to work with materials and forces. The katia bars continue, continually rearranges wires in new and different patterns configurations. And here again, you see these variations coming in to what is a major form. No matter how strong the winds are, or even if there is a monsoon storm, my Katiyas will not budge, proclaims Loha Singh, the pro protagonist of the evocative documentary Katiyabas on electricity theft, which came out in 2013 and some of you might be familiar with. But through improvisation, the Katiyabas also invents affects, arboreal affects felt and sensed by macaques. The animal's pattern mobility along electric wires renders the meshwork into a tactile or haptic space, much more than a visual one. Macaque's movements through the electric grid are now beginning to have bearings on the work of infrastructure providers. When the simians get electrocuted or entangled in wires, the attention of closely related members of their natal group is quickly drawn. To protect their kin, the latter prevent repair teams from disentangling the animal often attacking linemen and onlookers, making it, making it unsafe for them to work. Infrastructure providers now increasingly collaborate with wildlife rescue NGOs, drawing the latter's expertise in dealing with macaques. Such situations suggest that the broader infrastructural ontology, which recognizes rather than effaces animal infrastructure enmeshments, is already being borne out in the lived city, where the very practice of infrastructural repair is also about responding to other than human affects. In Delhi, DISCOMs have come up with a number of steps to suppress minor practices. This includes the installation of new meters that measure something called the power factor, a relationship between voltage and current. Highly altered power factors enable detecting whether electricity is being purloined from other sources. In 2017, DISCOMs filed close to 4,000 complaints of power thefts, and nearly 3,000 cases were registered by the police. Completely removing theft, as the policeman remarks, is not practically feasible. There are numerous administrative and operational reasons, and exact connections are often difficult to locate at a time of a raid. Furthermore, local strongmen intervene and hinder officials from carrying out raids, and the Katiabas takes advantage of the, of the confusion of tangles to graph connections that elude state and corporate surveillance. Why should I be scared of the government when electricity does not scare me, asks Loha Singh, who mocks the government by purloining electricity. Providing illegal connections for a, for a living is a risky and hazardous vocation, but is, it is also an intrapolitical activity, a strategy of resisting power laws, bypassing state scrutiny without open contestation. So during the course of my fieldwork, several households in a lower middle class Delhi Development Authority residential colony resorted to abandoning the new electricity meters DISCOMs had installed. They argued that macaques had developed a habit of ripping them off. What monkeys get out of destroying meters we can't tell, remarked a resident, but they play with the device for a while and then leave them only to steal another. When complaints were put forward to police authorities, well, the police remarked that theft laws were for humans and not macaques. BSES Rajdhani, the local power supply, apparently replaced more than 50 damaged or missing meters. Whilst it is difficult to fathom as to whether macaques were the sole cause of missing meters, for it was highly plausible that they were surreptitiously, surreptitiously removed by people, there is little doubt that other than human agents can get enrolled in subversive acts. Indeed, there is much more to heaven and earth than that is dreamt of in the discounts philosophy. 
other than human agents summoned to make infrastructural claims can extend to the spectral as witnessed in Delhi's famous episode of Monkey Man. In the summer um, month of May 2001, an elusive monkey-like figure attacked and injured a number of people at night and mainly during events of power failure in working class settlements in Ghaziabad and Delhi's east. It was a monkey all right and about four foot tall, remarked the victim, but as soon as I grabbed it, it turned into a cat with tawny glowing eyes. The assailant morphed over time from a macaque to a mutant cyborg by, by the time the scare became rampant and the number of incidents increased in Delhi. Forensic reports from psychiatrists later concluded that the monkey man phenomenon was an outbreak of mass hysteria. Injuries reported by victims were either caused during panic attacks and the majority were self-inflicted. The political scientist Aditya Nigam has drawn attention to the spaces of subaltern existence, terraces, vacant lots, low-rise buildings and urban villages that Monkey Brand brings to life. Others, such as Aman Sethi, foreground the splintering urbanism that Monkey Man indexes, a city, in his words, of the exhausted, distressed and restless, struggling with uncertainties of eviction and unemployment. But there is also an infrapolitical dimension to the Monkey Man phenomenon. As events of attacks took grip and spread across Delhi, the police urged the state-run power company Delhi Vidyut Board to ensure uninterrupted power supply from dawn to dusk so that panic residents could feel safe. By the middle of May, a few weeks into the monkey man phenomenon, the number of hoax calls alleg allegedly citing the creature went up. There were connections between citing calls and Delhi's frequent power failures. Residents called the police every time there was a power failure because they believed that the police would be forced to restore power before a search. The spectral monkey turned cyborg was being deployed therefore by people to make infrastructural claims. By the time the number of sightings had crossed 100, over 1500 policemen were on the street patrolling Northeast and East Delhi alone. The shadowy creature had also brought about transformations in public trans provisioning of electricity. The Delhi Vitru board sprung into, ac into action, repairing street corner lights across the city that had been defunct for months. Power cuts during the night had completely stopped in many localities and crime rates of the metropolis came down. Whilst mass hysteria might have manufactured Monkey Man, the phenomenon and its histrionic personas cannot be seen outside of eviscerating forces that relentlessly dispossess the poor without relief or mercy. Equally, it cannot be read outside of an infopolitics enacted through the virtual and the fantastic. At stake here are practices that typically go unnoticed and operate insidiously beneath the threshold of political detectability. Infrapolitics, as politics in the minor mode, does not exist in itself. It exists in relation to a major politics of infrastructure. Infrapolitics is an investment in the latter's laws, regulations, and technologies for purposes of making them minor. The Katiabas, as I've argued, works to avoid detection. Creating a bypass is very different from open resistance, and it is precisely these itinerations, his journeys, that render his practices infrapolitical rather than subaltern. Infrapolitics derives from a transversal and, heterogene and a heterogeneous collective, not an organized community and neither an assemblage of things. Sightings of monkey mans and, and attacks by the creature do not confront state order or challenge governors. Yet, it enables making claims on infrastructure. Minor ecologies then foreground a whole set of other stories and infrapolitics vibrating within the major logics of infrastructural governance and assembly, not graspable in the analytics of informal urbanization as it stands. How am I doing for time? Okay. So let us return now to Delhi's Connaught Place. Amidst corporate offices, banks, and high-end retail outlets is one of the city's Hanuman temples, a space attracting thousands of footfalls every day. The plaza besides the temple has rows of stalls selling flower gardens, uh, garlands and religious paraphernalia. Astrologers and palm readers wait at tables for clients to come by, whilst the destitutes sit at the temple entrance, relying on religious prescription and sympathy to get by amidst rampant immiseration. The space is what one might call an inadvertent commons, a space of economic make-do. Yet, 
An account of economic assembly remains incomplete if one ignores the ubiquitous macaques. Devotees, often instructed by feed, uh, priests, regularly feed these animals. Kusum, a middle-aged woman, purchases two, banana, uh, two dozen bananas every week from Akash, a vendor whose trade is contingent upon people buying fruit to feed monkeys. His makeshift stall is strategically located by the entrance of the temple, where macaques congregate to attract buyers for his commodities, the ultimate consumers of which are not all human. Kusum, like hundreds of other devotees visiting the Hanuman temple, initiates contacts with, contact with the animals that are otherwise engrossed in their own simian doings. She calls out to them with bananas in hand. Feeding macaques in, is an act through one which receives punya, a cleansing merit from God. And through this dan or gift, volatile energies are harnessed for the individual's protection, fortune, and well-being. Troubles go away when you feed them, says Akash, the banana vendor. He sells over 70 dozen bananas a day, and more so on Tuesdays and Saturdays, days of the week which are considered auspicious in terms of Hanuman worship. So whilst written out of mainstream accounts of um, the informal urban economy, or the Jugar economy, if you'd like to call it a term that's been used in South, in, uh, South Asia, these arrangements and improvisations involving Hanuman devotees, banana vendors, and the rhesus macaque can be thought of as infrastructural. They constitute and, sub and subtend the maintenance and reproduction of economic life. Here, Abdul Malik Simon's evocative contention of people as infrastructure provides a helpful starting point. Simon extends the concept of infrastructure to include people's activities in the city, the forms, in his words, of economic collaboration between residents seemingly marginalized from urban life. Relations become infrastructural less because of an adherence to specific rules and have more to do with the capacities of people to improvise. Improvisation here also involves the macaque's actions. The animal on in, um, increasingly relies on provisioned food in Delhi's urban environment, even modifying behaviors to elicit sympathetic responses in people. The groundbreaking work of the ethologist Aninda Sinha, with whom I collaborate and which um, is, is very much part of this uh, urban ecologies project. Uh, and India is an ethologist who's been studying macaque behavior for the last uh, 30 years. His work shows how macaques adopt several novel behaviors to elicit affective responses in people. Bipedal begging, which is standing erect on hind legs whilst making contact for food, is a strategy that certain animals learn to deploy, particularly when macaques and human worlds coincide. A corporeal technique mirroring their Upright human counterparts, macaque generate, macaques generate sympathy to spark affective exchanges. Sinha's work in other parts of India shows that whilst adults might resort to scaring humans into giving up food, younger animals waiting in the sidelines make eye contact. When the eyes of people in macaques meet, juveniles extend their, arm, their hand, palm up in this sort of manner, soliciting food. The gesture is sometimes punctuated with a soft coo call. And if needed, the individual often orients its body to remain in the person's field of vision. The hand gesture, reported for the first time in a wild monkey, is only used by macaques for communicating with humans, but never when interacting with their own species. The coo call is unknown in, you know, Sina argues, is unknown in the species in the wild, and the origin of this gesture are unclear. Can it be that macaques saw humans reach out for food with each other as Sinha? And is it a possibility that macaques learn from humans when developing this particular um, behavioral gesture? In certain parts of India and elsewhere in the world, improvisation takes on further novel formations. This includes the process of bartering or commodity exchange, a two-way process, uh, a two-way traffic in things where macaques play an active role. For instance, as you see in this video, I hope it plays. Um, animals steal items that have no direct food value. And as you can see here, there's a macaque with a shoe, with a, with a pilgrim's shoe. Scarves, glasses, shoes from pilgrims in temples, returning them as tokens in exchange for food. In most cases, macaques will only let go of the stolen object if the preferred um, food item is furnished. So you can see here, in this video, it's a little work. He's got the shoe. 
people saying he's coming. See, they're giving him a biscuit, but he's not left uh, let go of the shoe because it's a particular food item that the macaque wants. And there are, so you can see, he's asking for the shoe. The macaque does nothing, and is holding the person to ransom. Now see, it's got this packet, it's dropped the shoe, and it's gone off. Um, oops, sorry. So animals steal items that have no direct food value, scarves, glasses, shoes, from pilgrims and temples, returning them as tokens in exchange for food. In most cases, macaques will only let go of the stolen object if the preferred food item is furnished. Vendors and shopkeepers in these locales often know that what food will entice macaques to drop stolen items and stock these commodities for sale, nudging people to buy them so that they can get their valuables back. And as you saw, this is in the Jakku temple in, 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 in Shimla. It's a particular food item that was given when the macaque dropped the shoe. And this actually has also been reported in, in Bali, uh, in Indonesia. So a set of economic practices take grip, contingent upon barter between people and macaques. And here, macaques have an influence on the transaction of commodities in what food is bought and what is offered. In fact, this particular banana vendor in, in Okla in Delhi had dug a well next to his stall in order to ensure that macaques remained nearby. When Delhi's municipal corporation came to capture the animals as part of a wider scheme you know, to create a world-class city and rid, it, rid the city of its macaques, that's part of the book chapter, as I mentioned, and I can't get into that politics here, um, so when the municipal corporation came, a fight between the residents and the corporation ensued. It is precisely at such junctures, precarious communities standing up for vulnerable other than humans, in which the infrastructural role of macaques come to the fore. So the municipal corporation came, they wanted to take the macaques, and then he kind of gathered people from the busty or the settlement, saying you can't take away these macaques, you know, our livelihoods are contingent on them, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but rather than re-territorializing minor infrastructures into a condition of innovation through which the poor must become makers of their own destinies, immiserating conditions should also serve as reminders of the fallibility of the welfare state and of capital that masks its predatory face. So we know we can't say that, well, these are going to be the infrastructures that will replace uh, the basic provisioning of stable, uh, staples for people. But nonetheless, you see how this innovation and improvisation that goes on, in which the macaque, I would argue, is quite central. So by means of a conclusion, one could argue that ethnographic commitments to the lived city, in this case guided by the macaque as an unexpected urban flaneur, marks a point of departure in terms of, of how cities are read through their infrastructure. The meshwork, affective economies, and infrapolitics show how infrastructures are much more than a structure of contact a strap or a substrate subtending human life or a locus of governance, an avenue through which people claim citizenship. I therefore argue that the constitution and effects, effects and promises of infrastructure are always in articulation with a sticky connection to other than human life. This is not trivial, for it constitutes an overlooked dimension of ur urbanicity. When the theoretical glance is deflected from the usual suspects, we witness a whole other politics and mode of inhabitation that resonate within a city. Minor practices of the Katiabas and the itinerant geographies of macaques recast the urban landscape as alive. By inventing lines, habitat is reworked as not laid out in advance, but under continual construction, reproduced and renewed through polyvalent connections. This account of the living city is much more than simply recuperating the elusive vibrancy of matter, for instance, that associated with new materialisms and you know, Jane Bennett's work and so on and so forth of the, of the electric grid. And, and uh, what such an account, I would argue, excavates is a far more complex suite of entities, agents, and forces, human and other than human, and a variegated set of cultural and economic practices, formal and informal, licit and illicit, that give the city its grip. Minor practices show how heterogeneous alignments between people and macaques can become infrastructural, vital to the ways in which the urban poor improvise and reproduce their frail, dispossessed lives. At stake here is a co-constitution of ecology and economy. 
The intrapolitical practices witnessed in the city operate not only beneath this threshold of political detectivity, as sort of discussed by James Scott in his work on intrapolitics, but do so by also summoning other, other than human agents, be they animals, specters, or spirits. They are not marginal phenomena of niche interest, and this is quite vital, but a part of the fabric of what counts as a city. If they do not appear in the extant urban canon, it is because the latter has a tendency to foreclose in advance who or what urban agents are. Intrapolitics, therefore, I would say is diagonal. And it also operates by summoning other agents and fantastic figures, seldom dreamt of in urban theory, but which become evident when you write infrastructure in the minor key. And uh, this is sort of part of a wider book, which is, as I said, was coming out. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Man, for the very fascinating lecture. Um, yeah, there's a lot of information there, uh, lots of stories. Uh, I want to introduce Sonny uh, Devabhaktuni. Um, who will be one of the discussants. Uh, he teaches design in the Department of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. His research focuses on urban infrastructures and collaborative processes in architecture. He's particularly concerned with how economic and political intensities overlap with imagination of space. So I'll let um, Sonny start. Great, thank you, Natalia, and uh, thank you, Man, for the talk. There's so much there to think about and also um, maybe discuss. So I wanted to get started just by asking um, a question about your fieldwork and um, how, when you're in um, Delhi or in Kona Place, do you relate to the monkeys or relate to the people? And also more specifically, the role of um, photography in your documentation. Um, I'm looking at this photo in the top uh, right, and there are a number of photos that kind of work in this very uh, elongated landscape format. And you um, choose, I think, to, to work in black and white, and there becomes a kind of aesthetic of these wires, which you um, described as, as in terms of a, of a meshwork. And I wonder to, to what extent these photos become in their deliberateness, um, become part of your argument. Um, maybe maybe we could start there. I have two other questions to get things going, but uh, maybe let's start with that. Oh, thank you so much, Sony. Um, uh, especially the second question. I, I really like that because I'm trying to experiment more with, with photography for the more recent work I've been doing on urban metabolism, which is going to be the next book called The Metropolis and Meta Metabolic Life, where photography comes in. And, and I'll, I'll get to that question, but on field work. So um, let me put it this way. I think what this project is, or what my work is not, is, is, is not an animal studies project in that sense, because what typically happens, and, and by defining what it is not, I want to say what field work is. Okay, so um, in a lot of kind of animal studies and multi species studies, the relations are always dyadic. It's always the animal and the human, you know, broadly how humans perceive animals, how animals inhabit these worlds, and so on and so forth. And that becomes almost the end point. In my field work, the method, a kind of this is a reflection afterwards, but the macaque becomes a, or the non-human becomes a vector into looking at a range of relations in the city and the material politics of city making. So instead of starting with, for, for research like this, the obvious, the usual suspects, as I would call them, would be the elect electricity provisioners and, you know, residents, you know, um, regulators and discoms and, and so on and so forth, where you only see a particular politics of infrastructure when you start from a viewpoint like that. Whereas in this instance, the macaques started leading me to a range of other kind of questions, the electricity, but the kind of forms of provisioning, um, macaques in you know, relations between people and macaques becoming infrastructural and so on and so forth. So you see these sort of three dimensions to infrastructure when you start with the macaque. One is the kind of rise of these non-designed landscapes and, and the politics underpinning that. Um, so you follow in terms of method, you know, it's really literally looking at macaques and 
why are they using the cables so much? And why are these cables here? And you know, you start going into that kind of story. The, the second theme I think is really the spectral and the speculative because that continually comes up. Um, you know, the Monkey Man episode was quite well known in Delhi. Um, but when I dug, dug deep, deeper into the archive, so part of this work is also archival, uh, looked at the newspaper archive, you see that a range of kind of infrastructural claims are being made by people using these fantastic figures. Um, and I think the third dimension is really as I kind of emphasize the relations between people and macaques as, as, as infrastructure. Um, and I think attending to that ethnographically, looking at where, you know, the, why are the macaques hanging around near, near these food stalls, um, start talking to vendors, you know, what are their views of, you know, the, their, their views of macaques and so on and so forth. You see that usually the, the, the mainstream account of this is that there's a monkey menace in the city and monkeys are a problem. But when you kind of work ethnographically with different interlocutors, those who are provisioning them, the, you know, here on the on the left is actually a daily wage laborer who says, well, I can't afford to feed monkeys like the way the rich do, but I can afford to give them one ice cream every now and then. And it's just, it's just, it's just delight. It's just pleasure. So you didn't start seeing that, well, it's not entirely a problem. You know, there are a range of other economic practices and things that, that emerge. So I would call this method a kind of more than human ethnography rather than a multi-species ethnography because it's it's about a more than human world and it's trying to address questions about life lived along um you know where the social is a heterogeneous collective where our staples of whether it's built form whether it's urban economy whether it's it's politics is always articulated through that through these transversal connections and i think it's really from the ethnography that this the stems and that involves looking seriously at the macaques and where it leads to. Um, in terms of your second question on, on, on the aesthetic and, and, and the black and white, it's, it's something I've been doing even more so uh, with, with my recent work on urban metabolism. And for me, I, I think the aesthetic of the black and white, or trying to see this in black and white is part of the fieldwork because you see certain elements Otherwise, there's a confusion of, you know, when, when I work with color, you, you see a confusion of elements. And I think working with, with black and white allows you to bring certain things to the foreground. Often things that would be in the background. So these wires would probably be in the background otherwise. But here yeah, the background comes to the fore. And I think um, working with black and white for me is also to think of a lot of urban photography, which and especially urban non-human life is, is very much in color. It, it, you know, it, it brings a certain, certain aesthetic to the foreground. And here I want to kind of bring out certain elements to, to, amplify, to amplify things. And, and, and to do so, you kind of cut out other things. I, I don't know whether it's a good answer, but what I've been trying to ex do now with photography is that, I mean, I. I'm not a professional photographer. I've just been using a mobile camera, which is a mobile phone, which is the most helpful because when you're doing ethnography at the same time, you're not actually garnering too much attention from people. Because if you know you went with a DSLR or something, people say, Oh, what's this guy doing here? You know. Um very often using a mobile phone allows you to blend in. You you're not that threatening. So I think it's that that element of field work is there. The second part is that um, it enables certain forms of looking. So just to give an example with photography, I've, I've been working with um, urban chicken outlets, you know, uh, meat outlets where they keep live chicken in urban store uh, shops in Gohati. And with photography, I suddenly started to notice that these broiler chickens are given um, high concentrated food, which then drops down below the cages onto the ground. And then you suddenly see there's a huge rat population below, which is eating this high, highly processed protein food. And there's a whole city underneath with all the burrows and so on and so forth. So I think um, photo photography allows you to look in particular ways, look at certain minute things that you wouldn't see. Um, and it's very much part of the method, but also I think part of the storytelling. It's not a very good answer, but maybe I'll, I'll keep it at that. No, I think I think that's uh, that leads to some other questions. Also, it's I think a good answer. 
um, certainly the, the notion of, of allowing the, the camera to be a way of looking more closely and allowing you to, to see things perhaps that weren't uh, visible with the, with the eye. I think uh, that also um, relates to, to much of how architects work in, in terms of drawing and in terms of taking photos, revealing things through that, that technique or through that method. Um, I, I wanted then to, to ask you also about uh, these acts of provisioning that you mentioned at the at the Hanuman Temple, and you, you described it as a kind of concatenated ecology, um, and how that kind of relates to um, what we might understand as the promise of infrastructure and the affect of infrastructure. Kind of if we situate promise and affect within these religious um, uh, kind of daily acts of devotion, because it seems to me a, 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 a different or a additional way of maybe um, nuancing the idea of promise or the idea of an affective relationship when it is kind of channeled mm -hmm. through these uh, provisions that um, are taking place through a, a religious belief or a religious um, understanding. And then, you know, how that kind of, I, I want to understand how that might also be situated within the context of um, more recent um, changes in, in, in India in terms of uh, a stronger or more nationalistic Hindu kind of um, movement in, in the country and certain parts of the country, and how that might be related to uh, the politics of, of what's been happening. It seems almost that there's a huge contradiction or in terms of people on the one hand wanting to to um you know get rid of the monkeys and then on the other um you know having them be such a central part of of uh, a belief or of this idea of a promise so i wonder if you could speak to that yeah it's a great question on promise because i never thought of these these relations as, as, as sort of as, as a promissory trope and it's interesting because when you think of that kind of promissory notion of infrastructure heralding modernity right? mm -hmm. that, that idea that doesn't quite hold in the same way I think this is very much about improvisation and that that is really the kind of minor argument that the major mm -hmm. key is that yes you know this is the promise of a better future this is the promise of development this is the promise of a better urban life and as we know you know bridges never get built you know roads never <laughs> never end up where they go and it remains promissory in, in that sense mm -hmm. i think it would be interesting therefore to contrast this with, with that promissory trope because if you think of the way delhi has been electrified it's largely been, especially in the so-called unplanned settlements, it's been through improvisation that electricity has ended up there, and then it gets formalized or regularized by the state, right? So it's um, so these inf these relations, I think, are not promissory at all in that sense. It's about improvisation, but mm -hmm. it's that a very interesting tension, I would say, the kind of major argument of of the promise of infrastructure and the minor variations of of improvising, of you know, hooking on, and, and and so on and so forth. But when you come to the kind of question of of provisioning, and that's that's really very interesting. What I try to do, and you go to read read the book, and it comes out this the, the whole chapter on this question of of provisioning. One thing that really struck me working in Delhi was commensality. You know, the act of sharing a common table to feed, and uh, that idea I kind of got from ethologists who call macaques a commensal species because they live in human environments and so on and so forth. But commensality is also this act of sharing food, right? Which is done here either for pleasure, but largely on the dictates of um, priests and astrologers who say, oh, you should feed monkeys in order to get rid of X, Y, Z troubles and, and so on and so forth. Um, in the second chapter in the book, I discussed this how astrology really was a kind of practice that gained ascendancy after India's um, economy liberalized in the early 1990s as a work of um, an anthropologist uh, who's really, ex li um, suddenly her name evades me at the moment, Catherine, um, 
oh, the name invades me, but she's kind of written extensively about how it is a way the middle classes try to cope with the changing economic uh, sphere. And with also, of course, the Saffron agenda, right, of pushing astrology as a university subject and so on and so forth. But for people to deal with the dilemmas of urban life, many resort to astrology. So in fact, with economic liberalization, astrology increased rather than decreased in India. And a lot of the people I've spoken to said, oh, well, we know these prescriptions because I watched something on YouTube. And in fact, I interviewed one of the astrologers and he had all these explanations of what the monkey does in terms of taking out your suffering and so on and so forth. So there's been a huge explosion of provisioning because of this, mm -hmm. um, which lends to the commercial angle, you know, these sort of banana vendors and the economy around it. But what's interesting around commensality itself is that I use this lens then to think in London, and you also start seeing commensal practices there. So people feeding the parakeets, so others not wanting to feed them, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, the move in the book as well is to say, okay, what happens when we start with analytics that are not drawn from the Western metropolitan familiar, you know? So what if we use an analytic from Delhi, which is commensality, and what, what, does, it, what does a city like London start to look like, which is what I try to do in the book. And you kind of arrive at this idea of urban nature as being post-colonial, that, you know, actually Western urban natures are post-colonial rather than a product of entirely a product of European modernity. So I think it works that way, the kind of provisioning argument. But then going on to yeah the whole right wing agenda that's that's uh, that's very interesting on on two grounds. So one is there's a work of um, Philip Ludgendorf who sort of argued in the early '90s how every city in India was trying to build a bigger statue of Hanuman than another, and that links really closely to the Rath Yatra in the 19. Those who are not familiar, there's a big kind of um, the BJP in the 1980s were kind of promoting Hanuman as, as, as a kind of god, one of their uh, youth, not, not the youth wing, but one of their kind of uh, more partisan wings is called Bajrang Dal, named after Hanuman. So the Hanuman as a god really became big in the early 1990s. And people have observed that feeding macaques as a result has also increased because of that. Mm. Um, what's interesting is in Delhi, and this is again about specificity, is that Culling is never a question. So it's not a question that you kill the macaques. You either you know, trap them and relocate, it, relocate them elsewhere. Delhi has done that. 20,000 monkeys caught in the last 15 years, but the macaques have, haven't gone away. They actually come into new territories. It's a whole other, other debate. But culling is never the question. And it's not necessarily entirely, I think, a right-wing agenda. It's, it's, the, it's a... It's a cultural belief or religious belief mm. that actually gives rise to this very particular ecology. And I think mm. that's very important as well, the way these relations take grip is because of those sort of spiritual leanings, not all of which are right wing, you know, so yeah. one has to keep that in mind, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so, sorry, just the, just to follow up on this, and especially you see this with cattle, where cattle now are becoming... Is simple, but I, I often think that symbolic politics is actually quite detached from what happens on the ground with cattle welfare, especially, you know, cows, a symbol, 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 mobilizing, lynching and all of that, but very little invested in actual cattle's welfare. So there's a symbolic politics that's happening, whereas the kind of lived material politics is often very different. Sorry. Um, so I want to invite anyone else who has questions to either put them in the chat or raise their hands. Um, I'm going to ask, I have one more question, um, and that's about this idea or the possibility of designing in a, in a minor key. You mentioned some kind of improvisational ways in which um, vendors had kind of arranged their stalls uh, in relation to the macaques, and I'm wondering if you've come across other um, ways of uh, designing, um, maybe not informal designing, but ways of improvising that are much more kind of uh, geared toward uh, the the macaques and, and their lives, um, designing on the part either of the macaques themselves or or of uh, people in 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 the, in the sites you've looked at. A great question. I think this is the image you were referring to where yeah. this person has dug these two wells to concentrate yeah. the macaques so that they are around. And when you know he's visible from the street, 
passers-by come and buy bananas and there's a transaction that takes place. And, and the macaque is really central to these transactions, right? It's, it's really, it's, it's, this is actually an ecological practice because he's taking macaques very seriously. Um, and I think that's, that's yeah, essentially designed in a minor key. This is probably one of the only examples that I've seen where you can see a deliberate process of, of design. Um, it's of fostering these sort of relations. What you see is a plethora of hostile design where, mm -hmm. you know, everyday objects are made, uh, you know, putting glass on, on, on say, we're very common in Delhi, putting glass along walls so that my mm -hmm. can't climb through, putting barbed wire in places. So you see the rise of hostile design uh, very much on the rise to kind of keep macaques at bay. But on the other hand, if you actually shift to places like London, so the book um, has this whole two chapters in the parakeets, and one is actually about designing for um, bird tables and bird feeders, which is a huge mm -hmm. industry. And again, commensality in the industry is a huge, like a 25, $25 million industry, a million pound industry in, in Britain, this wild bird food. And there's a whole kind of practices of design for fostering those kinds of relations. I wouldn't say those are in a minor key, hmm. um, but just going back to your question, I think there are two things. So one is, of course, this process of improvisation and assembly that leads to the rise of, you know, this kind of form that then is non-designed but, but is repurposed by macaques, right? These. Hmm because of grafting onto the grid and, and, and so on and so forth. But how would one want to design a city for non-humans? And that's a very interesting question. My colleague, um, Jonathan Metzger uh, in, in Stockholm has written a very interesting piece about moose and how you, know, how you might kind of get to a cosmopolitics of planning to think of how you might allow moose to, to protest. And he gives his examples of road accidents so he says, well, you know, road accidents are not great for moose. You don't want them, but that becomes one way through which the moose can exercise their presence being felt. Mm -hmm. And therefore you then try to design, I don't know, passages or whatever. So I think in this way, it's probably allowing for these agents to, to speak, so to say, mm -hmm. and then working out designs which are not hostile, um, but maybe more accommodating. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's it's I think it's it's very much a situated ecology. Um, you see this kind of constant repurposing with cattle is another instance. Um, so urban dairies, which are kind of made sometimes with or in informal settlements, I have a PhD student, uh, Sneha Gutkutia, who's been working on pigs in Delhi, and she shows how people repurpose all kinds of things from thermocol boxes to make them into mangers for feeding pigs and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of improvisation that happens. Um, there's more improvisation than deliberate design and it would be really interesting therefore to think of say a slum and you know people keep lots of animals in slums and how might you then kind of rethink design to also accommodate this sort of wider collective of life it's not just accommodating mm -hmm. human beings and people but actually um, the animals that live with them I, mean, I don't have an answer but I think it's definitely a great studio for someone to do mm -hmm. Natalia, do you have um, any questions? Looking to see if anyone's raised their hand. Um... Yeah, um, thank you, um, Man. I'm. I I was thinking because I'm. I'm actually working a little bit with. I'm trying to get students to think a little bit more about these non-human um, actors in the city and um, in Hong Kong, and. Um, for us, I think, like I, I guess, what what we're not used to is is or what we would like. I think what would be uh, useful to to tell students is is how, what are the methodologies that you utilize to like is like it's. I know that it's a lot of it is observation, but a lot of it is also like questionnaires or, or questions to to people in parks. I don't know exactly like how you do it, um, and also what is your time frame. Like how long does it take for you to study these these um, uh, species to be able to understand kind of their their because because their their behaviors ha are ch changing all the time as they adapt to the city. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of questions, I think 
if you'd ask me for a kind of prescription, I would say, well, you start out with really observing, hanging out, you know, what anthropologists would call deep hanging out. You just hang out in a place and observe, see what's going on. Um, and then kind of maybe devise questions rather than having a list of, oh, do you like macaques, do you not like them? How should we design? How should we do this? You know, I think let let those questions emerge from a hanging out in a place where you start noticing, ah, you know, this vendor has dug this well there. This is what he's doing. You know, you kind of, those moments can never come from pre-designed questions. So I think some amount of deep hanging out is really needed to then generate meaningful questions. Um, in terms of following the animals, timeframes, I mean, that, I would say at least a year, you know, you really get to know and understand um, what, you, you know, if you want to do ethological work, you know, I've drawn largely from the work of Anindya Sinha, who's, who's looked at macaques and other places. But in these particular situations, you need, I would, okay, a year would be very lavish, but I would think at least, uh, I mean, you're talking about a year if you want to do an ethological study and really map their home ranges and so on and so forth. But I would still say something like two months where you are following the animal, you know? So looking at where, say, for instance, where the macaques roost, so the work that I did with cattle was following them along streets and trying to map where they feed, where they rest, and so on and so forth. So you need about a couple of months or, you know, depending on the animal, something like a cow is much easier to, to find. Yeah, the big Rats one. are very yeah. difficult. They disappear, right? So if it's wild boar, you might want to, yeah, at least spend a month or two trying to see, you know, where do they, where do, you know, where do they come out at night? Where do they rest in the day? Uh, what are the parts they take? And, and that takes time. It, it really takes time. You could also do it via, you know, using camera traps and so on and so forth. That that could, uh, that allows you to kind of document presence, also e even behavior. Um, so I have a postdoc who's working on the foxes in, in, in London, and he's installed cameras in people's gardens, which video the foxes, and he's trying to get people as interested participants to uh, write, do their own ethograms. An ethogram is a kind of it's a table which kind of tells you what you know, which maps their behavior basically. You know how much time are they spending feeding, how much time are they interacting with one another, what objects are they kind of interacting with, and and so on and so forth. So trying to get people to do their own ethograms. But his project's been for about a year, which is remarkable because he gets the whole season when the fox den you yeah. know they kind of build dens under sheds and stuff like that but i would think really following the animal you would at least need two or three months um to get get some but you could do it you know shorter you you get some data at least but follow the animal is my advice follow the animal yeah Questions from the students or audience? I guess, well. Well, I think it's also uh, close to time, um, um, so we won't bother you more, like man. Um, thank you so much um, for being here with us and giving us these amazing stories that, um, yeah, like this enmeshment is really fascinating. Um, yeah. So well, thank, thank you, you so much for yeah, yeah, inviting yeah. me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And um, thank you, like I, I'll just finalize by telling everyone who's here that our next um, lecture series talk uh, will be on the 14th of March. And this is going to be face-to-face -face, um, in Noll's bu building. And it's Peter Vaestra from Lola, Ar um, Lola Landscape Architects. Um, so you'll 
find out more um, during reading week. And I think we have reading week next week. So I think a lot, I think students are ready to take a break. Um, so I'll see you, we'll see you, we'll see everyone um, when you're back from reading week. Thank you, Sony, so much. Thank it's you, Natalia. Thank you so much, man. It's great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.